आने दे हेलो एवरी वन सो फॉर टूडेज क्लास विल बी डिस्कसिंग एंटीसेप्टिक्स एंड डिसइंफेक्टिंग्स नॉर्मली इट्स अ वेरी ड्राई टॉपिक सो फॉर दोज ऑफ यू ऑलरेडी जॉइन आई एल जस्ट गिव यू अ ब्रीफ ऑफ व्हाट वी विल डू टुडे इट्स यू नो नॉर्मली मोस्ट पीपल हु टीच फार्माकोलॉजी और मोस्ट पीपल हु टीच यू दिस टॉपिक आर गोइंग टू टेल यू इट्स अ वेरी ड्राई टॉपिक बट इन दिस प्रेजेंट सिनेरियो इन दिस एरा ऑफ पेंडेमिक व्हेयर पीपल आर डिसइंफेक्टिंग मोस्ट थिंग्स दैट आर अवेलेबल टू देम इट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट for us as healthcare professionals to understand what these antiseptics and disinfectants are to basically know where which product can be used so for that you need to understand the different types of antiseptics and disinfectants that are available and what are the different uses and very importantly what are the precautions that you need to take care of you know while using either of these products so in a span of say around uh, the next 30 to 45 minutes i'm going to try to give you a brief overview you should know the names you should know the uses and like i said very importantly you should know the precautions all right and uh, if you're awake at the end of these 30 minutes i will try to give you a you know a small little trick that will help you remember this topic a little better so moving on with the topic proper so before you go on to what are the different types and you know learn the big names that are associated with this let's just first see what are antiseptics and what are disinfectants so very often in a lot of books you come come across a term called germicide so you need to know that when you add side at the end of any word c i d e it means it kills it So if I'm saying bactericide, that is a substance that kills bacteria. When I say germicide, it's a general term to refer to substances which have the potential to kill germs. So with that in mind, you've got to know that both antiseptics as well as disinfectants are germicides. So they come under the broad category of germicides. So these antiseptics and disinfectants are essentially agents. which inhibit or kill microbes upon contact the major difference between the two of them is that antiseptics are used on living surfaces like skin or the mucous membrane so we talking about soaps hand washes you know uh, or mouth washes you know substances like that substances that can be used in those substances in those preparations essentially to kill all microbes and disinfectants are used for inanimate objects like instruments or water supply so easy way to remember this antiseptics are used on surfaces that are alive on living surfaces disinfectants are used on surfaces that are dead or inanimate inanimate surfaces or inanimate objects all right so those are antiseptics and disinfectants again i'm repeating these come as a classification or a sub category for the bigger class which are germicides so this is about antiseptics and disinfectants i would also like to introduce uh, the difference between 
two very very commonly used words in our lives nowadays sterilization and disinfection so sterilization you've gone to operation theaters right you've gone to places which have to be absolutely clean which have to be absolutely sterile meaning they should be devoid of all organisms okay in any form so most of these antiseptics and disinfectants may not kill spores whereas sterilization means you're completely killing all forms of microorganisms including spores this is a catch so now you may ask why do not we why don't we want complete sterilization in for our surfaces like body surfaces or for instruments also so practically speaking it may not always be possible that's the simplest answer so what do we go for then we go for disinfection all right so sterilization is complete killing whereas disinfection is a reduction in the number of viable pathogenic microbes so you are reducing the number of germs that are present on a surface say on your skin surface or on an instrument to that level that they, they are no longer a health risk for the individual okay so for a person who has a normal host defense it's very important to know so for you and me who have a normal immunological response once a surface has been disinfected or once the my skin has been cleaned with an antiseptic the number of pathogenic organisms on that surface become so low that the chances of me acquiring the infection become very less and that is what we are trying to achieve because that is what is practically possible all right so these are the basic terms you need to know very very importantly for the entirety of the class i need you to remember that antiseptics are on alive surfaces disinfectants are used on dead surfaces if you can remember this this will be very useful for you another important thing don't think that these are exclusive and we don't think that substances that are used as antiseptics cannot be used as disinfectants sometimes it's just a different of difference of their physical properties or their concentrations all right how that happens we will see in the next few slides so um, there will be a big list of now a list of names or whenever you see classification for antiseptics and disinfectants that's the part of the reason why it becomes so boring to read them actually so uh, before you go through this let's see how they act you know a very general brief mechanism for how they act on so if you think of a bacteria which you would have drawn since you were in 11th standard just think of a cell for that matter it is going to have a cytoplasm which is the protoplasm in case of a bacteria it is definitely going to have proteins which will help it survive mostly enzymes that can that are contained in it in that protoplasm and lastly it's going to have a membrane it is bound by a membrane which actually makes it a living organism a living cell okay right? so for here taking the example of a bacteria your disinfectants and antiseptics can act by three mechanisms either it can oxidize the protoplasm hence killing the bacteria or the proteins that are present inside like i was saying mainly your enzymes enzymes that are responsible for creating proteins or for substances uh, that are responsible for catalyzing reactions which are very important for the survival of the organism so those are denatured by a lot of antiseptics and disinfectants and lastly if you actually think this is just common logic so if you actually uh, destroy the membrane by some form or using some substance if you increase the permeability of the said membrane what you are doing is you are introducing the bacteria to everything that surround it you are actually damaging the integrity which will going to which is going to cause death of the organism so three things if you remember the cell in general so all this is a very generic action this in turn should tell you that antiseptics and disinfectants mostly that we uh, see today or use today most of them have a broad spectrum of activity it is not going to choose that i'm going to kill say only uh, a bacteria that causes a specific infection say a lung infection or a skin infection it is going to generically kill all all organisms that have a permeable membrane but selective for the microorganism right because we do not want damage to the skin that is why you have a separate antiseptic group so i need you to remember that uh, these antiseptics and disinfectants can act by one of three mechanisms either there will be oxidation of the bacterial protoplasm or denaturation of the protein most commonly of the enzymes which are also essentially proteins 
and lastly it can also increase the membrane permeability okay which is sometimes called detergent like mechanism all right so here you can see there's a list of really a really long list for what it's worth around 10 names random 10 names for you to remember you'll see one by one and i'll try to give you really common day to day examples which will help you remember them better okay just don't worry about this list as of now we'll come back to this list in the end and see how how well you remember all right so first and foremost let's look at alcohols okay the common commonest example for this is ethanol and isopropyl alcohol of these two you've got to remember this name isopropyl alcohol okay isopropyl alcohol is very very it's a very effective antiseptic antiseptic specifically on alive surfaces so first thing that should come to your head is that it is going to be used on living surfaces so uh, when it is a very effective antiseptic when used at a concentration of 40 to 90 percent and uh, the action rapidly increases to 70 percent the reason i'm telling you this is that most preparations that you have available will have around the 65 to 70 percent of isopropyl alcohol alcohol concentration right so uh, i told you this is an antiseptic so we're talking about skin surfaces so you'd be surprised to know that or probably you already know for those who of you who have not seen or read the contents do that today go and see the sanitizer that you use on a daily basis because most of these sanitizers are alcohol based drugs and the most important constituent of many sanitizers in fact almost all of them is actually isopropyl alcohol even if it is a, a herbal preparation it is going to show you or it is going to specifically mention that there is a 70 percent alcohol and all these products combined together are going to produce produce a 65 to 70 percent alcohol content so very important use is in alcohol based drugs not just for healthcare settings you must have seen in the wards you have spirits as well as for personal use which are hand sanitizers nothing but that all right so uh, when you talk about healthcare settings think about the rub the spirit that you have in the ward like i just mentioned so think about the injections that you give on a day to day basis you need to first disinfect that place using an antiseptic you're reducing the number of bacteria or the uh, living organisms that are present over there before you inject something into a sterile environment of the body before you put a iv cannula so before you put an injection a hypodermic injection you will use this all right so this antiseptic should be associated with isopropyl alcohol so that you remember that it is used in alcohol based drugs okay now when you talk about precautions think of a time when you had a cut on your hand right and you used the sanitizer by mistake the first thing that comes to my mind the first thing that should come to your mind is that it stings right it is it is really going to burn over there so you should remember that it should not be applied on open wounds ever. This is one practical aspect that you people should know and should remember. It is a highly irritant substance and hence should not be applied on mucous membranes. All right. So the first group of uh, antiseptics and disinfectants that we've discovered that we have discussed till now are alcohols. Most commonly used isopropyl alcohol around the concentration of 70%. Take your sanitizer bottle, see the concentration. Remember that spirits in hospital or wards that we use are most commonly isopropyl alcohol. This is isopropyl rubbing alcohol or spirit, it should be around 70%. All the sanitizers which we use at home, very, very important. It's an irritant, should never be used on mucous membranes and should not be used on open wounds. So because this is not a one-on-one -on -one class and I cannot see all of you on a one on one basis i just try to repeat everything so that it is reinforced in a way so that you do not have to go through it over and over again okay. so moving on to the next group of antiseptics and disinfect disinfectants that i discuss is bigonide so uh, the example for this is chlorhexidine okay the name may be a little complicated but it becomes easier that for you to remember that it is actually used in savlon it's one of the components of savlon so mechanism if you want you can remember 
if you think you can do or just generally men mentioning the mechanism of the three effects you know that it affects either the protoplasm or it affects your uh, uh, proteins or the membrane that should be sufficient for you if you want to remember you can remember for each individual class as well okay so uh, chlorhexidine if uh, for chlorhexidine like i was saying for isopropyl alcohol you've got to remember rubs sanitizers and spirit for chlorhexidine, one thing that I want you to remember is that it's a very important component of mouthwashes in the dentistry. So basically in the dental side, it is one of the most widely employed antiseptic, right? It can either come in the form of a mouthwash, an oral rinse or in the form of a toothpaste. Okay. That is the one of the major uses for chlorhexidine. Apart from that, when I tell you it's a part of Savillon. It should indirectly give you a little bit of clue that it can also be used as a skin antiseptic, right? But first thing you do after you have an injury, it's either Dettol or Salvin to clean your skin. So uh, with that in head, you've got to remember that it also has antiseptic. Of course, it is an antiseptic that can be used on your skin. The other things, it can also be used for surgical scrubbing and your little bath. But if you remember that it is used as a skin, like a general antiseptic on your skin or as a mouthwash, this is this is the part I want to want you to specifically remember with chlorhexidine, if not anything else that I've got over here. Okay. So the major problem with this is that it can sometimes actually leave an unpleasant aftertaste. Okay. And uh, repeated applications because of the color over here can cause a brownish discoloration. All right. So just to recapitulate what I told you, we are talking about chlorhexidine. It does not matter if you remember the group or not. Good if you do. It's a biguanine. Uh, it is a cationic antiseptic, which most common, which is the most widely used antiseptic in dentistry. Okay, it has either a mouthwash or a toothpaste that I've shown over here, and it's a component of Savillon. Major problems: the taste. The next group that we are going to see are halogens. So halogens. I uh, if you go back to a little bit of uh, elementary chemistry, huh? 11th and 12th chemistry, halogens is that oh, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine group. So of that, iodine and chlorine are two most commonly used halogens as antiseptics and disinfectants. So it's not just uh, the gas or the compound itself that is used, but it's also used in the form of a 4. Whenever this word 4 is attached in the end with the halogen, it implies that it's nothing but a complex of that substance with a larger molecule, larger organic molecule, basically which acts as a carrier. Uh, specifically, if you see for substances like iodine and chlorine, what happens is they are either unstable or they are irritant. So to reduce those properties, you make complexes with organic components. So once you do that, it actually makes the compound better but retains its antiseptic and disinfectant property. All right. So let's see first for iodine and then I'll tell you about chlorine. So both of them, iodine as well as iodophore, are uh, broad spectrum microbicidal like I was telling you before and uh, wherever it's specific I will mention or the books usually mention if you go through them. It iodinates and oxidizes the bacterial protoplasm and um, Again, like I said, if you can remember well and good, if you can't remember well and good, just remember the general mechanisms by which it acts. Iodine, um, you all would have seen tinctured iodine. It's a very, very important part of first aid. You can, um, a mild 2% solution in alcohol. It has a very strong de property. All right? Sometimes it's used even before surgery. Another thing you would have heard of is iodex. Iodex is a non-staining ointment. Um, this is for completion purpose. Mainly I want you to remember tincture iodine over here. So the problem with iodine is if it's a stronger solution, say greater than 5%, it's going to be corrosive. Okay. So it's going to be corrosive. So the smaller ones, if they have applied on, you know, uh, if the smaller concentration ones are also applied on open skin or an open wound, it's going to have some irritant effect. So now to reduce this irritant effect and to prolong the action, like I said, it's going to have some advantage when you add the word 4. 
So to make it non-irritant, to make it non-toxic and to prolong the action, you make an iodo 4. You combine with povidone. So what you get eventually is povidone iodine which is an iodo 4. Okay. So this povidone iodine is something you all would have seen. If not, go and check in your wards, see in your operation theatres whenever you post it there. So these are substances that are used for surgical scrubbing and for disinfection of endoscopes and instruments. Especially if you are going to uh, gastroenterology or ENT, you can actually check this out. Alright, so I said again, halogens I'll discuss too. One is iodine and the second is chlorine. Again, if I'm talking about chlorophores, it is nothing but a soluble complex of chlorine with larger molecules, larger organic components. That's the purpose of adding the word four to distinguish. Now for iodine, we saw that that iodo four was actually making it non-toxic, non-irritant. In the case of chlorine, what it does is it stabilizes. Chlorine gas is highly reactive. It's, it's very rapidly acting, but it's highly reactive gas. Okay. So what a chlorophore does is that it prolongs its action. It causes slow release of HOCl. This is nothing but hypochlorous acid. All right, hypochlorous acid. This hypochlorous acid has similar, eventually this also releases chlorine, which has the disinfectant property. Okay. The examples over here for chlorophores are chlorinated lime, which is nothing but bleaching powder, and sodium hypochloride. Um, for chlorine uh, and for both chlorine as well as chloroform, bleaching powder for that matter, you can remember that it's used to disinfect water supplies. Very important from a healthcare perspective is that sodium hypochlorite is used to disinfect blood spills. Okay, so I'm showing you over here a 4 to 6 percent sodium hypochlorite. So, normally, if you have a 5 percent sodium hypochlorite solution, that has to be diluted to one tenth, making it 0.5 percent. Okay, so after if there is a blood spill ever in the ward, first thing that you need to do wear gloves, clean the area with normal soap and water, clean it till it is visibly clean, till nothing else is visible in that area which appears dirty. Over that, you have to disinfect the surface using sodium hypochlorite. So the 0.5% sodium hypochlorite that I just mentioned that you can make from a 5% solution that you have to saturate it to fill that area with 0.5% sodium hypochlorite. Alright, and then that has to be washed off with a lot of water. Okay, so that is the basic procedure from our perspective which is important which is what you need to remember when you that uh, chlorophore specifically sodium hypochlorite is used to disinfect blood spills. Now uh, the main precaution that you need to know uh, is that it causes release of chlorine gas which itself has a potential pungent and an irritant nature. It will have a very typical smell when you mix bleaching powder with water or when you go to pools that have been disinfected with chlorine, you get this pungent really, uh, smell which is because of the chlorine gas and uh, it is also inherently irritant in nature. So if you are exposed to a lot of, lot of fumes because of the bleaching powder and water combination, just remove yourself from that area. Okay? And you need to adequately protect your mucosa while cleaning um, with these substances. Okay? So just to recapitulate, so far we have covered alcohols from which I need you to remember isopropyl alcohol which are rubs, sanitizers. Second we discussed biguanides, mainly chlorhexidine, uh, like I said, a general antiseptic as a part of Savalon and uh, third uh, and mouth and in dentistry it's very commonly used. And lastly halogens, that's the third thing that we discussed, specifically iodine and chlorine and then pores. So iodophores, povidone, povidone iodine and chlorophores which is sodium hypochlorite. Okay, this is just a brief recap for you. Uh, moving on, we'll go to phenols. So uh, phenol, phenyl, which is still so widely used to clean our floors, especially in our country, you just get them in random bottles. So it is one of the earliest used antiseptic and disinfectant. Okay, it acts by oxidizing protoplasm. So it is used, it, it's primarily used as a disinfectant. Disinfectant be dead surfaces. So it's basically used to disinfect, disinfect surfaces wherever there is a urine, feces, pus, putin. So these all can infect an area and those surfaces can be cleaned using phenol. Alright, uh, 
these cause skin burns these are very very irritant and that is one of the basic reasons these have been replaced by more of their derivatives you know phenol derivatives such as cresol and chloroxylenol so chloroxylenol is the major component for detol okay so from phenols i need you to remember the fluoro cleaner and chloroxylenol if you think of detol again like savlon it is an antiseptic so it is non corrosive non irritant to the intact skin so it can be used it can be used for surgical asepsis also because it is non corrosive and non irritant it can and we know if you think of it all we know it has more of an antiseptic property can be used on living surfaces so you have all these skin creams soaps hand washes mouth washes so chloroxylenol can be a component of all those so essentially its use is use is use is as an antiseptic having said that again like i said these are not exclusive any substance that is used as an antiseptic can also be used as a disinfectant at higher concentrations so detol you know is also used to clean surfaces if you want to disinfect them all right so important for you to know is that it will lose activity if diluted with water and stored for a longer period so if you are diluting it you need to prepare a fresh solution every time so the next one is an quaternary ammonium compound cetrimide see cetrimide and chlorhexidine which is a bicarbonate both of them are cationic detergents both of them combined together make savlon okay so from this class uh, i'll just tell you four names in the end and i would like you to remember write down those four names if you're still listening and that will just give you a brief of the entire class that i discussed all right so this is also a cationic detergent it's an ammonium compound so it's cationic and the, the general mechanism is similar to most that we discussed it has a glue cleansing action it will efficiently remove dirt grease blood there are various roadside accidents you know to clean those wounds it is also used in sanitizers it can also it, it is also used to disinfect surgical instruments again i want you to go and see wherever i have written these instruments i want you to go and see wherever these are used okay in your words that will help you remember these substances better that's all and uh, the main problem with this is this has a tendency to form a film under which the bacteria can thrive so if you see savlon uh, it, it's clearly you can see over here it is chlorhexidine and cetrimide it is one of the most popular hospital antiseptics and disinfectants and i am very sure that all of you would have seen at least one bottle of it either at work or at home so uh, let's move on to aldehydes um formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde these are broad spectrum antibiotics main action is through the uh, oxidizing action or the destroying of the protoplasm formaldehyde is not used anymore because again like chlorine it has a very pungent odor and it is irritant and more importantly because you have glutaraldehyde available glutaraldehyde is less volatile as compared to formaldehyde it is less pungent less irritating sorry and has better sterilization action than formaldehyde it is also used for disinfection of surgical instruments see i have been talking for almost 6 7 slides now this is the first place where i have used sterilization and sterilization is one word that we always associate with places such as the operation theater so no to sterilize an operation theater most commonly the substance that is used is glutaraldehyde okay however it has a very short half a shelf life that is one of the major things if it is stored for a very long duration it may lose its potency lastly coming to oxidizing agents potassium permanganate and uh, hydrogen peroxide both of them have the uh, property of oxidizing the protoplasm which leads to killing of the microbes potassium permanganate uh, is actually irritant it's not commonly used but there are still some places where it's used for disinfecting water see because i told you it's an irritant they dilute it Uh, to very large solutions, like a very very dilute solutions, one is to four thousand and one is to ten thousand solutions, and those solutions are eventually used for gargling, for irritating, irrigating. I'm sorry, it's not irritating; it's irrigating cavities and wounds. And um, the main problem, like I say, it is irritant in nature, so it can cause burns, blistering if it's not diluted properly. Okay, the potassium permanganate crystals themselves are highly corrosive. Okay. 
and the another problem that it causes is going to promote rusting. So you cannot disinfect the instruments with it. So this is almost obsolete. It's used in a very few places. More commonly, uh, if you have to use an oxidizing agent, we use hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide also oxidizes the protoplasm. It's an oxidizing agent. And uh, the other advantage that it actually confers is it uh, this catalase that is present in the tissue. Uh, in the presence of uh, catalase in the tissues, what happens is this H2O2 causes foaming. So anyone who's gone to a surgery ward and you have seen wound cleaning and if they put hydrogen peroxide, the next time you see that, you can observe that it's going to cause frothing at that place. So because of that frothing, what happens is it loosens and removes the slough, the dead tissue that is stuck to your ulcer surface or to your wound surface which is what we want when we are cleaning wounds so that it you know promotes wound healing if you remove all those things. So that is one place where prominently your oxidizing agents are used, specifically hydrogen peroxide. The main problem again, it loses potency and storage. They cannot be stored for a longer period of time. Okay. The next three that I'm going to talk about are just for completion surface. You will relate to them on some levels, but it just for sake of completing the topic. So acids, metallic salts and dyes. Acids, boric acid, benzoic acid for that matter, salicylic acid. These have a bactericidal effect. Uh, they are included in prickly heat powders mainly. Like mm, you have nicin, you have dermicool, things like that. So uh, they are included in those powders and sometimes even in ear drops. And they are also used for irrigating bladder for large wounds. So uh, essentially, if you see, and it's one of the antiseptic side. It's used on the skin. Um, problem is, it can also uh, be absorbed systemically and cause damage to some of your tissues, such as your kidneys. And um, metallic salts, such as silver compounds, silver nitrate cream is something you will see, which is used for uh, uh, neonatal gonococcal infection, and it's and secondly, you can also see sulfur, sulfur diazine creams which are used for or gels which are used on burns. So uh, this is also to prevent infection because they are all raw surfaces, this burn specifically. The one problem with the uh, silver salts is that it can cause black staining because of silver deposition. It's not just silver, you also have mercury compounds, but again they come with their own set of toxicities. Still, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, that is what I have written over here, so that it's easier for you to remember. You can definitely go back and read more on it. And lastly, dyes such as uh, gentian violet, which I've mentioned over here. A uh, few others, acriflavin, methylene blue, those are also used. But most commonly, you'll see gentian violet. And used for farunculosis or farunculus pustules basically, and bed sores and ulcers. So again on the skin. So all three that I mentioned over here, if you remember nothing, you can just think of the compounds, acid, boric acid, metallic salt, silver compounds, and digestion valid. All of them are antiseptics. So once you think, go in that direction, now you can think of the skin surfaces where they are used. Okay, this is just for you to remember. The main problem with gentian violet, it's a dye. Okay, for any dye, the major problem is it is going to cause staining. Alright, so this essentially concludes our uh, entire presentation on this uh, topic, which is antiseptics and disinfectants. So let me just go back to the beginning and um, when, when we expect an answer or when we have an answer, a 10 mark question, that is the one thing, This there are just uh, three or four things that I want to carry out of this class, if you are still there with me. So first thing I want you to remember is if you get a question on antiseptics and disinfectants, I want you to be able to define them. Remember, antiseptics and disinfectants kill microbes. If it is killing microbes, not spores, kill microbes uh, upon contact. If it's you're doing that on a living surface, alive surfaces like skin and mucous membrane, those are referred to as antiseptics. And uh, secondly, germicides which kill like substances that kill microbes or, and are used on inanimate surfaces such as a wa water supply or such as on instruments, they are called disinfectants. So D for D. These two things I want you to remember. Next, if you can, we'll be really happy the mechanism of action by how they act. And then comes this big classification. I said I look at this at the end of this class. So last three, I said these are just for the sake of completion. 
So I'll tell you a way for remembering these seven. I find the names really weird, not connected in any way. One way to remember them, like probably a very weird way would be to think of all the uh, organic chemistry classes that you've taken in 12th. So think of alcohols, everything, alcohols, halogens, phenols, um, aldehydes, everything that you can think of and just write them together and think of names. But that doesn't work every time, you know, you're trying to remember it. So because I've included examples that you see commonly on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll just narrate a story and see if you can relate to the story and remember it. For those of you who are still awake, I hope this is useful for you people. And those of you who are not, probably you can ask your friends later if you're listening to this right now. So when you go to, when, uh, like I said, this topic is really, really important because more and more people are using antiseptics and disinfectants today. So uh, I, I think of a story as to what you would do on a daily basis, okay, if you had to include antiseptics every day. So you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you, you brush your teeth, you use a mouthwash, right? Um, then you go, you have to sit down to have food, or so you are taking a bath. Okay, and you disinfect the water you're using. Then you sit down to eat food. You have to wash your hands. You have to sanitize your hands. Once you're done, you go to the ward and you see the patients over there. Once you're done with your duties, you go to the OT, the operation theater, assist there. And then you come back to the ward again where you're informed that there is a blood spill. This is the story. Now see where everything fits. So you got up, first thing. You got up, brushed your teeth. Remember I told you, biguanides, which is chlorhexidine, is most commonly used in dentistry. It's the most common antiseptic. So chlorhexidine, uh, commonly used as in dentistry, is your biguanide. First category to remember. Then, you went forward, took a bath. There, you can, if you want, you can remember phenols over there. Or have another place. You know, your surfaces were cleaned with phenol, your, the place where you took a bath. So when you're taking a bath, the floor is clean with phenol, it's a floor cleaner or uh, say it is disinfected with Dettol. So what is disinfected with Dettol? You use a Dettol soap, right? So that is chlorxylenol or phenol. That's the second category. Third category is when you sit down to have food. You have to sanitize your hands. You use this hand, hand sanitizer. Like I said, rubs most commonly contain isopropyl alcohol, which is the third category, alcohol. Um, now you go to the ward. In the ward, you get a lot of um, in bite cases or you know some wound cases, and you have to clean those. You're cleaning the surgical wounds. You do oxidizing agents, which are hydrogen peroxides. Okay. Then you go to the operation theater. I said from the ward. So once you go to the operation theater, you have to think of aldehydes because it has been sterilized using glutaraldehyde, one of the major uses of glutaraldehyde. Then you are cleaning the surfaces of the patients or you are cleaning the skin before performing the surgery using iodine, halogens or iodophores which is povidone iodine. Alright, now you come back to your uh, ward. Uh, let me see. Okay, you come back to the ward and you have been informed of a spill. Now for disinfecting blood spill, we all know you use a chlorophore, which is sodium hypochlorite. So by tracing your steps, you took a, you brush your teeth, you took a bath, you had food, you went to the ward, to the OT and back again. So if you take this pattern itself and you split it into different components, you can actually include all these antiseptics and disinfectants and remember them along with their uses and along with the precautions. Okay? You can keep adding your own stories as to putting injections in the ward where you have to use it up. You know, just keep modifying it up and down as you like. But this is one of the easiest ways I think you can actually remember at least these seven compounds. Alcohols, isopropyl alcohol, biguanides, chlorhexidine, a component of sabalon, halogens, iodophores, tincture iodine, pogdan iodine, or sodium hypochlorite, chlorophore, phenols, chlorozylenol, which is nothing but uh, at all. Quaternary compounds, cetrimide, again a component of Savalon along with fluorexidine, aldehydes, glutaraldehyde, and finally oxidizing agents. Very important here, I want you to remember hydrogen peroxide. Alright, uh, with that, uh, we we'll end our class. And uh, any questions, you can get my number and you can feel free to contact me.
or you can come to the SR room uh, and Dr. Sneha. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll just see, finish this class for you people. Uh, do you have any questions? You can ask me now. I'm back on the screen again. Okay, I think we'll call it a day. आप बंद करना है